Hello everyone and welcome back to Transfer Review. It is back for another season. It is the summer, football season is over. It can only be the Transfer Review is back. The only place, I think, to hear about all the best news and gossip in the window and over the next coming months actually. And I'm delighted to be joined for the first episode back by Mikey McCubbin. Mikey, how are you and how happy are you to have transfers back on the agenda? Oh yeah, to be honest, yeah, I've been missing them. I've been missing them a lot. You know, April yes. and May, big, you know, you know, the, the, the months where there's a big game every single night. To be honest, by, yeah, by the end of May, I was pretty fatigued. So, yeah, bring on the transfer season. Um, and, yeah, bring on the, the best show that this channel has ever produced, Transfer Review. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting stuck into it. And to be honest, actually, we, we joke and laugh, you know, the transfer season does obviously get a bit tiring after a while. But, as so, like... Compared to previous summer transfer windows, I feel like there's been actually quite a lot to get our stuck, the teeth stuck into in the opening couple of weeks. So, um, so yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to discussing transfers today. Genuinely, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, it's it's been crazy. The amount of deals that happens before the windows opens, Schlossbeck, etc., moves like that to Dortmund, and then I mean, just looking on Twitter today, we're seeing Lacazette. He's all about to sign with Leon. Renato Sanchez agreeing personal terms of AC Milan, Botman potentially as well. Inter Milan looking like they're going to get Torino's Bremer. There's talks about Dybala, whether or not Spurs will move Bastoni, whether or not they're going to negotiate a swap deal with Villarreal for Pau Torres and La Celso. I mean, it is literally all happening very on early in the window. And actually, one of the stories which we're not covering on the show today, but it looks like it's going to be featured heavily across Football Daily is what Darwin Nunez to Liverpool mm. between, potentially this is sort of we knew that Klopp likes him but this has come out of nowhere let's talk about 80 million euro opening bids in my opinion way too much for Nunez I mean what do you make of that so far yeah I mean it's it's, it's pretty mad isn't it again like like with a lot of Liverpool transfers to be fair like they tend to come out of nowhere and, and usually they're pretty successful once Liverpool want their man uh, usually they get him, um, you know, aside from with Chiromania, of course, but, you know, they, they clearly didn't deem him worthy of 100 million euros like, like Real Madrid did, and we, we'll get onto that very shortly. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the thing is with Darwin Nunez, he's been, what, like, one of the top striking prospects in Europe for the last three years. Um, you know, Benfica obviously got him in on a, on a pretty good deal. Um, and, you know, he, he's very, very impressive. I think, you know, he splits opinion a little bit. I think, you know, you know, there are questions over his technical ability, etc. But we do have to remember this is a 22-year-old striker. Um, you know, most strikers in Europe don't really start to hit their peak until kind of 24. Um, and yes, there's the questions over his kind of experience in a top, you know, in a top league again. But the, the thing is with all of these things is that if Liverpool are willing to put up that much money for him, then I think there's a reason why. You know, they've got one of the best yeah. scouting networks and one of the best, um, you know, analytics departments in sport, full stop. Um, and so, so when they're serious about him, um, you know, I think people do need to kind of listen a little bit. And yeah, it's an inflated fee, but, you know, so was, you know, Luis Diaz, you could argue, was a bit of an inflated fee as well. So... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny one. And I, I, I think this might, you know, come from the fact that they weren't able to sign Shuermany. So there's, you know, a good kind of 60, Minus 70 time. million euros there that, that wasn't there before. Maybe their other midfield targets are nowhere near that kind of price range. And they've, you know, decided that, you know, if Sadio Mane is to leave, then actually we can allocate a bit more money um, to signing a forward. Um, I guess the question mark is, is that with Mane leaving as well, you know, I guess, I guess it kind of means that, you know, maybe they are... Uh, focusing on, on centre-forward rather than on the left where Diaz will, will be playing for the foreseeable. Um, also, you know, Salah, I guess it means maybe they're, they're more confident that, that he's going to sign a new deal as well. Um, because, yeah, potentially next season we're going to have Nunez, Firmino and Jota all vying for that centre-forward position. So, yeah, it'll be very interesting. Um, yeah, I think it is an inflated fee, but, um, you know, Liverpool tend to get it right with those big transfers, don't they? Yeah, true. And I mean, on the flip side of Salah, if he doesn't sign, then maybe they are looking to shore up that attack now before people realise they're desperate next year if, if the Salah negotiation is going wrong. So yeah, a fascinating transfer, well worth watching, which we, I'm sure we will do across Football Daily. But you touched on it a little bit, the transfer we like. The transfer we want to talk about this week is Aurelien Chouameni to Real Madrid. Big move, McCubbin. I love this one. Big fan. 
Yeah, I mean, it's the biggest transfer of the... Well, actually, Erling Haaland, to forget about him. <laughs> but, uh, but the, you know, the most lucrative transfer, at least, of the window so far in terms of a fee. Um, and yeah, it's followed kind of months of speculation, hasn't it? Uh, it was confirmed on Tuesday um, that Madrid had beaten Liverpool uh, and PSG to the capture of Aurelien Um In the words of Fabrizio Romano, Klopp called him for Liverpool. PSG made the best proposal, but Schermaini only wanted Madrid. Uh, his contract runs until 2027. Los Blancos pay an initial 80 million euros with 20 million um, in add-ons. Um, and, you know, I guess like with Liverpool, you know, with like that reasoning around Darwin Nunez potentially, um, you know, Real Madrid were left with a huge transfer kitty, weren't they, after losing out on um, Mbappe. Of course, he would have arrived for free, but his wages would have taken a decent chunk out of their budget. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of completes their midfield regeneration, doesn't it? Obviously, you know, Casemiro is, is, is 30, uh, Kroos is 32, Luka Modric, of course, turns 37 next season. Um, so yeah, for a while, you know, we've been talking about them needing to renew that midfield. Um, and even though those three players are all, all staying, um, it's just great future-proofing, isn't it? Germany, mm. you know, can develop alongside one of Europe's, you know, the, the other kind of European central midfield young superstars in Eduardo Camavinga. Obviously, they play together for France as well. What a great duo that could be. Both really versatile yeah. midfielders as well. Like, you know, they can both play in a more defensive role or they can both play as a number eight. Camavinga can obviously play in a more creative role as well. Fede Valverde, of course, has, has really developed this season. It'll be interesting to see whether he's utilised once again on the right side of attack or whether he'll be brought back into the midfield. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of options now for Real Madrid. Um, I think it's a really exciting time for them in terms of their midfield. Um, very few clubs can claim to, to, to be as strong as them in that area, perhaps Manchester City um, in Europe. Um, perhaps Bayern Munich as well. Um, but yeah, so they've already signed Antonio Rudiger this summer on a free, of course. Uh, they're looking to sign a forward. Gabriel Jesus and Raheem Sterling uh, are both in the discussion now, aren't they, in the rumour mill. So it'll be interesting to see if any of, if any of that comes to fruition. Um, but yeah, Isco Bale and Marcelo have moved on, of course. Um, so yeah, it's looking like a, a decent summer for them, getting rid of some of the old guard, bringing in um, you know, fresh talent. Um, and Chouamani, you know, looks all ready to be their marquee man. Um, but Henry, I mean, he has had a pretty remarkable season, hasn't he? What What are the kind of main reasons to part behind this transfer, do you think? He's had a remarkable few years, hasn't he? I mean, signed from Bordeaux by Monaco in January 2020 for 18 million euros. Absolute snip. What a, what, what a nice bit of profit on that <laughs> for the Monagas side. He's only missed five games the last two seasons. He's always there. He's always playing. He's the most used player in their squad and uh, probably the most important in many ways. Uh, this season, maybe only Alexander Nubel in goal has been as important to Monaco. Uh, sort of the Bayern Loney absolutely crushing it in between the sticks. But yeah, if we look at Chiumeni's numbers, he really can do it all in the midfield, can't he? I mean, 71% aerial win rate is nuts uh, for a central midfielder. And this season, he's winning 6.5 tackles and interceptions per 90. Also huge. Only nine players in Europe's top five leagues produced more in 21-22. But in the words of Patrick van Straten on our Explained on Chiumeni, which you should watch, the rest of the players who were doing better than him played for garbage sides, <laughs> which I think we have to be, which I was quite shocked to see in the script. But, uh, but basically his point Very is that Monaco are possession, yeah, uh, Monaco are possession heavy sides. And the fact that, you know, Chiumeni's putting up these numbers um, for one of the best teams in France is pretty remarkable but then he's also a stunning pass and dribble of the ball he's I mean, a very powerful runner completes 75 percent of his dribbles that's more than Declan Rice five progressive five progressive carries as well and then passing I think uh, he's pretty similar to Thiago and Rodri really in his in certain metrics he's 87 percent pass accuracy which is pretty elite and he's among the top 20 percent of midfielders for things like progressive passes long balls and Actually, he's. He, I think he played more passes under pressure than anyone in the Monaco squad last year, which shows a real kind of state of mind and calmness to his ability. And that's because teams realise if you shut down too many, this is the way you get the better of this Monaco side. Big loss to them. Uh, Didier Deschamps has recognised the talent that he's got at his disposal. Bear in mind, Deschamps doesn't tinker with his team a lot, getting a lot of criticism online for maybe not playing around the team as much as he should do. Some really disappointing for Le Bleu in the recent... Um, 
Nation League's fixtures as well. But if we look at Chiuameni, he's already got 10 caps for his country, a goal as well. And he started the Nations League final against Spain uh, what, back in the summer. So that really does um, show how important that uh, the 22-year-old is perhaps in Deschamps' plans. Looks like he is the kind of successor to N'Golo Conte in many ways. Like we said, there's an explained on Chiuameni if you guys want to know more about it. But I mean, it's interesting who Monaco are going to try to replace him with. Um, talk in French media that either Brighton's Yves Basuma could head back there. I think that'd be a good deal. Or Lille's six foot five talent Amadou Onana, who really is kind of the next Chiuameni to look out for. An absolute giant in the midfield for Lille. Huge young talent. Um, I've given the amount of players they're selling this season. I'd be surprised if he leaves quite yet, but he's certainly worth following at the moment. But yeah, I mean. All in all, McCubs, how, how highly do you rank this deal of Chiuameni to Madrid? Yeah, I mean, it's bloody expensive, isn't it? <laughs> it's super, super <laughs> expensive. Um, but I think, you know, in, in some way, I think Monaco just played played Madrid really well there. You know, they, they, they knew that they had a lot of money to spend and they named their price. Um, and, and Madrid, you know, you know obliged. Um, but, you know, it could still prove, I think worthwhile um, you know Chiuameni looks like a world class midfielder in Liga and like you were saying his his defensive numbers and his passing numbers are just absolutely elite level um, it will be interesting to see how he does in a, a different league you know La Liga is very di it was obviously a very different proposition to Liga and, um, not as strong as it was a few years ago but nevertheless no. is a step up I think um but he's going to be playing in a, in a much better technical side. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see how he does in La Liga. Um, yeah, he's, he's obviously an immense talent. Um, you know, you only have to see, you know, watch a few minutes of him kind of to, to, to see just, you know, just how switched on he is as a midfielder. Um, so, yeah, I think this is going to be, yeah, I'd be very surprised if this doesn't work out well, basically. And I think, again, this is like, it feels like um, a kind of investment for life. Like, I, I just don't see... Yeah. where Chiuameni goes from here like I, th I feel like he could just be there for the next 10-15 years so yeah it'll be interesting to see yeah I love that really fascinated to see what this means to like transfer values across the rest of Europe with you know players like Jude Bellingham etc what does it mean to their valuation but what do you guys think at home about Chiuameni to Madrid let us know in the comments down below we'll move on to the best bit the transfer we don't like so yes, yeah, time for the transfer that we don't like now. And Henry, this one came a bit out of the blue, didn't it? Gareth Bale to Hitafe. What on earth is going on here? Yeah, I mean, to be clear, it is a rumour at the moment. It's a story, a bit of credibility, but it is a fascinating, it's a funny one. Obviously, the big question is where Gareth Bale is going to be playing next season. Uh, Wales are in the World Cup. First time since 1958, Bale is going to be leading them to that tournament. You really feel like that's going to be it for him afterwards but he needs to keep fit in the meantime obviously a free agent after running down his deal with Madrid where I actually think he did pretty well over the nine years what scored 106 times 258 appearances three La Ligas five UCL crowns you can't take that away from him at all he turns 33 in July so it is sort of in the twilight years of his career certainly considering his injury record his shocking injury record it has to be said uh, but yeah he's, he says he's received a load of offers um, so far unsurprisingly places like America all interested him certain clubs back in the UK too and actually one of those Cardiff City really looked like the one where he was going to go in an audacious move uh, it looked like he was going to go back to the city where he was born and raised we even saw the Wales head coach Robert Page that ticks all the boxes Telegraph reporting that Cardiff are preparing some kind of bid to bring him home, potentially along with Aaron Ramsey as well. Even though, I mean, his wage bill at Real Madrid was bigger than their entire weekly budget back at Cardiff. You know, he was earning 600k a week. So clearly he would just be doing it almost for nostalgia, uh, nostalgic reasons. However, uh, on Wednesday, it emerged, um, Getafe president Angel Torres told Spanish journalist Alberto Fernandez that the former Spurs star had been offered to them. Um, and this would be, to be honest, all things considered, even more outrageous than him moving back to Cardiff City, considering Getafe's minnow status. Or is it, though, McCubbin? Because actually, when you really, when you read into it, it there is like an element of plausibility to it. Although I wish it was Rio Vallecano that he was going to. Yeah, Vallecano would be a more fun club to go to, wouldn't it? Um, but yeah, I mean that. Yeah, it's, it's not completely uncredible. Um, you know, back in April, El Chiringuito claimed that Bale wanted to set, uh, stay in Spain, although this was largely 
dismissed at the time. El Chiringuito, hardly the most reliable source. <laughs> um, but you know, his agent Jonathan Barnett, who's obviously been very close to him for a number of years, um, has always insisted that his family are happy and settled in Madrid. It was quite telling that when he joined Tottenham on loan uh, the season before last, that his family didn't join him there. Um, and you know, signing for Hetafe would obviously, yeah, allow him to stay in Spain. Um, you know, the club's ground is just. 30 minutes from the Bernabeu so you know if kind of family reasons are, are at the forefront of his kind of thinking in terms of his next move then yeah like Getafe would would make a lot of sense um, and you know you'd imagine that he'd be you know pretty welcomed with open arms by the the Getafe faithful. Um, Torres the um, the president is, is quoted as saying, I have to think about it and talk to the coach. I don't know if he's going to come. Um, the coach, of course, is Kike Sanchez Flores, um, obviously best remembered um, here in England for his multiple spells with Watford. Um, although, yeah, <laughs> didn't have a great season last season. Hatafe finished 15th after flirting with relegation. Um, so, yeah, Bale would obviously be straight in the first team, uh, probably partners, partnered with Enes Unal up front, who, who had a pretty good season, all things considered, scored 16 times. Um, for the club um, so yeah this is definitely a possibility however from my personal perspective I feel like Bale just needs to go somewhere where he's actually maybe not going to play that much um, like Hetafe and Cardiff he's going to be yeah, first name on the team sheet um, you know in the months leading up to the World Cup and that obviously increased the chance of um, of injury and I feel like Bale's priority has to be the World Cup to be able to lead Wales, you know, out to their first World Cup, like you said, since 1958. Um, you know, that that's the surely the pinnacle of his career, pretty much. So, like, I, I kind of feel like there's been talk about, you know, maybe returning to Spurs on a free on reduced wages and just being a backup up front. Like, I feel like that kind of situation would actually kind of suit him because his Real Madrid situation has actually suited him down to the ground, hasn't it? Obviously, on <laughs> massive wages, but not playing too much, you know, just being able to train and just keep in good condition for you know, the important games, which are for him international games. Um, I don't think he really cares that much about club football, if I'm honest. At least he didn't at Real Madrid. So yeah, a, a move to somewhere where he yeah he can kind of be a bit of a cheerleader would, be, would suit him quite well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what your thoughts are, Henry. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, the, the problem with signing Bale, for, even for someone like Getafe, obviously it's good marketing, but yeah, how much commitment does he really have to the cause? Is it a case that once the World Cup's over, He's just going to disappear. Is it a case that in the run-up to the tournament, we're going to suddenly see lots of niggling injuries that are going to rule him out of matches? Mm. I mean, that, I, I do think it is slightly risky. It'd be kind of funny if he went to Getafe. I agree. I'd almost rather he went, stayed in La Liga, than came to the championship. For a lot of the reasons you're suggesting there, I think in the championship could be... It just takes one bad tackle. It's not. I mean, the the, champ, the quality in the championship is pretty high these days, but it's still... You know, it's a busy schedule, busy season. As you say, he'll be... Cardiff will be expecting him to play um, and yeah I think the, the risk of injury would be higher there Getafe you know not bad so I did a lot better actually I think they were doing really badly brought Flores in and he managed to turn the ship around a little bit so yeah I for me I, I really like your logic there about Spurs I think he would be a viable backup to Kane off the bench but I just think at this point it's either Cardiff or Madrid obviously his agent Jonathan Barnett has come out and said he doesn't even have the Getafe president's number however you never know. But everyone at home, where do you think Bale's going next? Where do you want him to go next? Uh, we want to hear from you. Should he go to Fulham, as I've been touting on Twitter? Harry Wilson, gonna Harry Wilson's going to get in his ear. Bring, bring him over to the cottage. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it already. But yeah, let us know. Anyway, McCubbin, that's it for the first episode of Transfer Review. Thank you very much for joining me. What should our Euro Football Daily faithful go and check out now? Uh, yeah, so if you want to hear about, more about Darwin Nunez um, and Liverpool's pursuit of him, go and check out Transfer Talk for, uh, from yesterday over on FD. If you want to hear more about Aurelian Schermany, we've already pushed to it. But yeah, um, a great explained that went out uh, about him on EFD um, on Sunday. So go and check that out. Awesome. And check out our new top 10s. We have brand new graphics mm. across EFD and FD. They're wicked. Danny Pate, absolute wizard on After Effects. So yeah, go show that some love. All right, thanks everyone. Subscribe, all that jazz, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.